Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's been covering markets now since 2013. He's an institutional consultant for hedge funds and institutional investors. He co-founded MacroVisor and TraderAid. You see his business partner, Aisha Tariq, on business television on Fox Business, CNBC, almost daily, Monday through Friday. Mayhem from Markets and Mayhem, co-founder of TraderAid and MacroVisor. Thank you for joining me again. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jason. It's a pleasure to be back. And you've been investing and trading in markets since 2005. You traded the tech bubble. You also have a tech background and a macro background. So for our listeners out there, Mayhem knows so much. He can just rattle off stuff. Our last conversations, literally, like your memory is incredible. Well, thank you. I really find it interesting to try to get into all these different disparate data points and see where there's convergences, see where there's interesting signals. And, you know, that's allowed me to kind of gain a level of passion and a level of interest that gives me a lot of memory retention, basically. You know, if, if I'm immersed in this stuff all the time and I wake up and literally within five minutes of waking, I'm reading financial news. <laughs> I'm digesting information pretty much until five minutes before sleep. So I live, breathe, and sleep markets. And uh, it's always a lot of fun to talk about this stuff. So thanks again for having me on, Jason. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So we're recording this interview on Friday, March 22nd, 2024. The 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, it, it has been like yo-yo. It's rallied again to 4.21. The market has not gotten the rate cuts it has wanted so far in 2024. The S&P 500 is still over 5,200. I want to get your thoughts, though, on where we are with the U.S. stock markets, with the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500. What are signs you think we need to see that the stock market is close to a top? Sure. I think that's an interesting question. So it really depends on time frame first. I mean, it's it's harder generally to find a long term top than it is a short to intermediate term top. So I would I would provide that as a caveat to start for the short to intermediate top. I think we look at very extended sentiment flows and positioning. We look at inverted call skew. We look at some degree of speculative euphoria. And we can say all of that is, is present. Now, that can lead to a correction in time, in price, or both. But it doesn't necessarily mean we have a longer-term top because of those conditions being present. I think what would make for a longer-term top is really seeing all of the market leadership roll over meaningfully without broadening out into other areas of the market. What I mean is, you know, we've gone from the Magnificent Seven to the Terrific Two, really. Uh, we've gone from, you know, all of those stocks, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, um, Meta, NVIDIA, you know, there and Tesla, they've kind of been replaced by just NVIDIA and Meta. Those are the Terrific Two. If the last two leaders start to really roll over, I would be very concerned about the health of this rally if it's not rotating and broadening out elsewhere. One of the trades I've been looking at and, and kind of waiting to see when it's really time to hit that trade hard is the equal weight versus uh, market cap weight trade as a pair trade or um, RSP versus SPY. So I have a small starter position. I took it in mid-Feb. It's done okay, but this is a trade that if that broadening out does happen, or if we have a rollover that's led by the market cap weighted uh, index down with those, you know, mag seven or terrific two leading the way lower, this trade could work out pretty well. Now, if those terrific two you know, if NVIDIA's narrative begins to break down for one reason or another, which it doesn't seem to be the case yet, people are still uh, happy to pile into calls. We saw the flows today. They're buying the 930s, the 950s, rolling millions of premium. It's easily the most traded single stock in options in terms of premiums every day. It's one sixth of all single stock premium flows happening every day. When that stuff starts to stop, you know, NVIDIA becoming the new Tesla, Tesla having a similar uh, dynamic back in 2021, I would be a little bit more concerned. So, you know, for now, we have a market that's still kind of narrow. We haven't seen NASDAQ, the smaller and medium stocks really hatch up here. The breadth underneath the surface remains lackluster. There's a number of ways I qualify that. I've got a momentum indicator I've built. 
I also look at uh, the NASDAQ McClellan oscillator. I look at new highs versus new lows in the composite. And everything's kind of painting the same picture here that we haven't seen this broadening out. Now, this wouldn't matter as much if we weren't making new all-time highs. But I would say the lack of upward participation by a broader swath of the market at this juncture does raise some concerns because it concentrates that material risk in really just two names at this point. But broadening out, really the top 10 S&P names make up well over 30% of the market cap weight. So we can see that something happens with the leadership. The whole market can roll over pretty materially at the index level. Why? Well, because they're just such a big part of it. Those same top 10 are over 50% of the NASDAQ. And we remember what happened in 2022 with passive investing flows being the prevalent part in such lopsided concentration in these very large stocks. When there is distributive pressure, they get hit the hardest. So I would just be looking at that as a sign of if there's bigger trouble to come, it's probably going to be when these major market cap stocks start to roll over and can't get out of their own way. Now, my kind of walking down the path of that potentially happening, and it's all theoretical at this point, but it would first in my mind really start with a lot of signs that lead down the path of these companies' earnings are slowing materially. Now, Apple, that's already happened. They've had six quarters in a row of slow sales, really not much earnings growth at all. If you net out all the buybacks they do, and it's extraordinary. The amount of buybacks Apple does is more than any other S&P company. But if you net that all out, Earnings have been pretty flat for six quarters. The Apple growth story, kind of dead. No car coming, AI not really going anywhere. The Visor, a bit of a, of a setback for the company's credibility in building high-quality consumer products. So that story is beginning to erode. Apple's starting to show signs of really weakening materially here. Tesla, you know, it was kind of looked at with marvel and, and, and imagination. This was going to be a company that was going to build the next era of full self-driving cars, robotics. That narrative beginning to break down, margins starting to look more like that of a conventional auto company. Until that narrative changes, you know, Tesla's kind of path of least resistance has become lower with some tradable bounces. And we're seeing similar with Google. Google's been struggling, their narrative about AI, you know, Gemini has been a bit of a disaster and Apple partnering with them kind of tells us both companies are having a bit of an existential crisis here. So I would say that we're already seeing some initial signs, but the big, I think, worry for the market would be that they stop carrying earnings growth. Because when we go back and we look outside of Apple, a lot of the mag seven stocks have been where the leadership is. In fact, if we take the NASDAQ 100 stocks out of the S&P 500, earnings growth has been pretty flat. So that would be my worry that the engine of growth which is these really large tech companies, to their credit, they've had, you know, outside of Apple and lately Tesla, they've had really robust earnings. But if that really slows and we see some cracks here with Apple and Tesla and starting perhaps with Google, um, I think that will be the moment that you see a bit of a shift away from them and going into other areas of the market that are objectively much, much more attractively priced. And I think the big, big worry would be that NVIDIA, which has become you know, really the center point of the market, drawing so many flows into the stock itself, into its options, into the SMH ETF, which is now 25% NVIDIA, 10% TSM. So it's like the NVIDIA and TSM ETF. If that stops, if the growth story struggles there, I think that's going to be a really big problem for the AI narrative that's powered this market higher. So that would be my roadmap is really seeing concern build around that narrative, around the earnings growth, and then seeing that de-risking starting to take the wind out of the sails of the market that seemed almost unstoppable. But underneath the surface, there are some cautionary signs here in terms of the amount of positioning, the amount of flows, the amount of sentiment reading, you know, really, really bullish readings, at least as of two weeks ago, it's moderating a little bit now per AA, uh, double I, but also seeing a, a turnabout in what investors are looking at. And one of the lines in the sand that I have is 4.5% on the 10-year. I do think if we start to push above that level, that's going to be another area that starts to put some pressure on the S&P and a greater extent on the NASDAQ as well. So you've also been posting charts, and this is another wor uh, one that worries me, is the amount of hedge fund leverage. And when I talk to like retail traders and hedge fund people, they basically just say, oh, I'm raising my stop loss limit orders. and 
if the trade goes bad, I'm going to get stopped out. It's going to be fine. I mean, you were trading during the tech bubble, right? There was a lot of people who uh, who had the similar type of uh, attitude where these tech stocks are going to keep going up. I'm just going to keep raising my stop losses, stop loss limit orders. I'm going to get stopped out of the trade. At worst, I lose 5 or 10%. But that exit liquidity, especially with the amount of leverage, it can dry up very, very quickly. And then some of these stocks can gap down in a like a bubble type environment, especially with retail, because I think retail, there's a lot of retail newbies. And, and this is anecdotal, but I'm just hearing friends, they had no interest in stock market. And all of a sudden, they're trading stock options on QQQ and NASDAQ 100 and S&P 500 and NVIDIA, and they're making thousands of dollars, and they think it's easy money. Yeah, it's it's very interesting what you mentioned regarding hedge fund leverage. I look at the Prime Desk data all the time from Goldman, from JP Morgan, from Morgan Stanley, from Deutsche Bank, really any any bank research that's large enough of a clearinghouse is important to me. And it's anywhere between 250 and 285% which is extraordinarily high. Their net leverage is increasing as well as they get more concentrated in these NASDAQ stocks, particularly the top 10. On the other side, their short positioning is largely in crowded single stocks. There's been some covering there. It's led to some pretty extraordinary trading opportunities. We've got a clean triple in Mara, for example, in December of last year off of that. But on the other side, you know, they're also really, really concentrated in shorts like the Russell and other macro products. And so you have these very strange dynamics that can play out on a strong down NASDAQ day where the Russell is bid almost counterintuitively, and it has to do with that disorderly deleveraging. But you bring up a really interesting point. They say they're moving their stops up. What does a stop matter for a stock? That's a question you know, that I always go back to. Now, my first trades were in the dot-com bubble. I did two. I did Amazon and Yahoo. They basically doubled the next day. I sold them both. I was a kid. I felt like, okay, I don't understand what's happening, but I know if the world was this easy, no one would work. And we have that kind of feeling, you know, and I remember getting in a, a taxi cab back then or going to the barber and anything. And they're talking to me and I'm a kid and they're talking to me about stocks, right? So everyone was talking about stocks back then. We do have a similar level of retail participation in these markets now. Now there's a big difference. The tech companies that are running higher actually have earnings this time around. But there's also a lot of speculative tech that's running in the background, like SoundHound and Big Bear AI and some of these other companies that may not necessarily ever make money. And there's you know IPOs like Reddit up almost 50% yesterday just because they sort of married themselves to AI, even though anyone who objectively looks at the site knows the only relationship they have with AI is that they're selling all their user data to AI. So back to uh, hedge fund leverage and stops. You know, the problem with equities that you don't have in futures as much that are liquid is a stock is just it's just an unlimited amount of risk in either direction. You have no way of knowing how this thing can move. And there's a whole period of time where the market is closed or less liquid pre-market and after hours, or it can move on an event driven catalyst. So you could be really, really long into something like SMCI. They come out and they say, hey, guess what? We're going to do an offering that could be dilutive. And then all of a sudden you get 20% down in two days. Did your stop cover you? Your 4% your stop when you have a 12% gap down before you're even able to get stopped out? No, you get stopped out with that 12% loss. And if you're really leveraged, that means you're taking a pretty big hit if that's a concentrated position. Now, for me, I trade a little differently in my swing portfolio. I don't let any single position cause more than a 1% drawdown if I can control it, which means my equity positions are always very, very small because I assume larger risk than just what implied vol or beta or average true range may represent. But for these folks out there that are running these really concentrated portfolios in just 10 stocks, this goes back to the material risk part we talked about before with narrowing leadership. If the leaders really do have a meaningful drawdown, that can lead to some cascade effects, particularly with the amount of that short vol trade that's on on the other side and the implied leverage in hedge funds in the crowded parts of the market. And we're seeing on business television, some of the portfolio managers or newsletters coming on and they have a tech fund and 70% of the fund is, is, is in NVIDIA or SMCI. Some of the, it, just crazy. And <laughs> oh, okay, so yes, they've outperformed everyone, but risk adjusted returns. I mean, like they're not diversified at all. They're, they have a bad, it's, it's more concentrated risk than Kathy Wood ever did. Right, right. Who, who, by the way, bought the Reddit IPO yesterday. But yeah, I, uh, I think it is really interesting that concentration risk. And again, you see it in the flows. I mean, it is 
absolutely extraordinary. I've been building tools to drill down into different flows and positioning in the options market. And the more I look, the more amazed I am, but by the just sheer magnitude of money flowing into NVIDIA, SMCI, Broadcom, Marvel. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. The only analog I have for anything even approaching that level is Tesla during its height in 2021. And the interesting thing about this is you see it in the skew dynamics as well. So I put out a chart recently of S&P skew, but you can see this in some of the more popular single stocks as well. Their skew gets so blown out, so inverted towards calls that you get these natural flows that actually, as the value of those calls decay, can put a weight on the stock, particularly as it approaches options expiration where there's a lot of interest, right? And so that's another sort of countervailing factor, which means in order to keep these things floating higher, you have to see greater and greater flows coming in to offset that decay. So is that like the opposite of a gamma squeeze? Because I hear everyone say gamma squeeze. That's why uh, NVIDIA and some of the other ones have gone higher the last couple of months. That's one of the main contributing factors. Yeah, I would say that a gamma squeeze is a big part of it. And so on the other side of that gamma squeeze, you know, you have all that built up premium in all those different open call positions and it's decaying with theta. And if price doesn't agree with their strikes, it's decaying on that basis as it uh, approaches expiration as well as there's delta dropping. So you've got market makers that need to hedge less and less shares to hedge those deltas. And so they'll begin selling those shares as time goes on and they approach expiration. So it's like, you know, you've heard of Vanna and Charm and how that impacts the S&P in a positive way because there's an implied volatility smirk towards puts. So then just invert that. You've got that implied volatility smirk towards calls and these really popular stocks, and that's creating the opposite types of flows, which end up being distributive. I also think there's a lot of flight capital coming from China and the European Union from managed money, retail investors, and portfolio managers that's coming to U.S. stocks too. So I think there's a lot of flight capital, capital flows that have come into short-term U.S. treasuries, as well as some of those NASDAQ 100 stocks as well. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I mean, look, if you're in China and uh, you have the ability to move capital outside of the country, you're going to do it. The country is in serious trouble. Are there going to be tradable pops in the country's stock market? Sure. Is it about flat year to date at this point? Yeah, when you adjust for currency, especially, it's not looking so great. But uh, you know, if if you're in over in that country, or you just had capital there, but you're not located there, you're basically doing anything you can to evade capital controls and get out. And on the other side of it, when you've got banks like uh, central banks like the Bank of Japan, who still you know net net they're injecting liquidity into the global financial system, that liquidity also doesn't necessarily stay in Japan. Right. So you do see that surplus liquidity making its way into the U.S. markets. The other thing that was a big contributor to last year's rally was the first half of the year, there was a cessation of debt issuance by the Treasury. So that helped to offset QT as well as, you know, excess liquidity from the People's Bank of China and the Bank of Japan. And then the latter half of the year, as debt issuance resumed, you had inordinate amounts of fiscal stimulus coming in and replenishing bank reserves as QT was um, kind of the countervailing impact. And, you know, the net net was liquidity rose. Financial conditions eased. We're now at a point where financial conditions are easier than where they were before the Fed started cutting. So is there a chance now that the Fed's making a policy mistake cutting at all this year? Yes, I think there is. And I think that chance is increasing should they do it with what we're seeing underneath the surface with some of these potential drivers of inflation coming back. Well, I think the Fed at this point, Jerome Powell and the Board of Governors, they don't have any good options, but a lot of it is because of a supply and demand problem with U the U.S. Treasury market. It's yes. because of the budget deficits. I mean, the 2025 fiscal budget projections, they just what passed another $1.2 trillion last night at 2 a.m. or something like that. So they're just the, the budget projections for 2025. Like there's so many false assumptions in there. I think we could spend a couple hours talking about all the incorrect assumptions in there. It's interesting too, though, because we never had a 2024 budget. You know, we're we're now in uh, we're now getting close to April. 2024's fiscal year started in October, October 1st, and they just passed it a, a funding resolution that takes us through the end of September. So basically, we're going to have no budget this year. So one of the biggest false assumptions for a 2025 budget is that we have one at all. <laughs> well, they're projecting what a budget deficit of 1.8 trillion, but they're also assuming that they can just magically collect another trillion dollars of tax receipts when they the tax receipts that they have collected the last couple of years have fallen below projections.
Yes, yes. And I think that that's another thing to take into consideration because the foreign bid has also dried up a bit for U.S. Treasury auctions. It's been a little better of late, but ultimately the Fed is likely if there is any reason for them to slow the rate of QT and push the maturities down towards bills and shorter duration notes, if there's any reason for them to cut their short term interest rates. It's monetizing the U.S. government's debt because there's really at the end of the day, they could foam the runway for a lot of the commercial real estate stuff by spinning up a facility like the bank term funding program again. But when you start talking about the magnitude of debt issuance that's happening at the U.S. government, and like you said, deficit spend increasing, interest rate spend going to get over a trillion dollars for the first time ever, possibly as soon as 2025, that's, I think, the biggest motivation here. And that means, you know, however we look at it, the Fed is becoming more politically accommodating, which is a big departure from what it should be doing. And it's also a big a departure from their dual mandate of maximum employment which from the metrics that they look at, you could argue we're at, and price stability, where we see a resurgence of not only inflation at the top line of CPI over the last three months, but also other factors that can feed into that growing as time goes on. So I know you and Aisha cover a lot of the earnings and conference calls for different companies and sectors. Are we starting to finally see a lot of the negative consequences of the Fed hiking interest rates, the lag effects on the real economy for a lot of these corporations, small business, and the consumer? You know, we're seeing, I think, a K-shaped outcome in business and in consumers. And really, it's in age groups and other parts of the economy, regionals versus money center banks. And we talked a little bit off mic about that. And that's what we're continuing to see. I mean, that we've got sort of like what was you know, late last year, the inglorious 493, maybe it's the inglorious 495 now, but the earnings from the, the companies outside of big tech have been lackluster. We're no longer in an earnings recession. So we have seen at least the market pull out of that environment. We did have about a three quarter earnings recession, but at the same time, what's really pulling us out of that are the top seven stocks. And at this point, really the top five stocks and it's narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. So I'd say the big concern goes back to what we talked about earlier in terms of, you know, that turning point is likely when those same big stocks aren't able to project high double digit growth and, and really show that that's something that they're able to do on an ongoing basis for the smaller companies. They continue in many ways to struggle. If you're a smaller, medium sized business in this environment, you're on a revolving line of credit. And that debt cost is has appreciated significantly over the last two years. So you look at those small and medium-sized businesses, they have to basically have their debt priced on whatever the prevailing interest rate is. And the Fed has a lot of control over that. Whereas you look at the really large companies, like one thing Apple did very, very right was refinancing as much of their debt as they could during that COVID interest rate low. And then, of course, amassing cash and parking that cash in treasury bills. So that spread allows them to earn a net interest margin. Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Apple, I'm sorry, Alphabet, they've all done the same as well. So, you know, it's a very, very interesting distribution of outcomes that we can see in all different pockets of the economy. My sense is that small and medium sized businesses, it depends on where you look. If you're in the manufacturing part, they're all struggling. In the services, some parts are doing better than others, but we're seeing a lot of weakness in financials and in technology. There are more job losses in those areas than really any other parts of the economy in the services industry right now. So by K-shaped, you mean more of like a bifurcated economy. So we're, we're seeing this on the conference all, calls. I'll give an example, like Darden Restaurants, which owns different restaurant chains. So like they own a high-end steakhouse chain, like Bruce Chris Steakhouse. They said those uh, restaurant locations are doing well, but their other um, uh, middle-class sit-down restaurants like Olive Garden and Red Lobster, Longhorn Steakhouse, they're not doing well and they're starting to close down locations. Yeah, that's a very good point that you brought up. And it is, like you said, bifurcated or K-shaped thinking like the top of that K looking at the top 25% or the top quartile, they've never done better. They're asset rich, they're earning better interest income, their home prices, their stock prices, they've all done really well for them. So they're fine. They'll eat out, they'll travel, they'll do everything like they used to. You look at the bottom two quartiles, particularly the bottom quartile of consumers, they're not doing as well. They don't have that high exposure to asset, the of, of, to uh, assets like real estate and especially to a high concentration of stocks. 
and their cost of living has gone up. Wages haven't kept pace for many of them. And so they're pulling back on discretionary spending. And that is hurting brands that cater to lower and middle class consumers across the country. And we're seeing that becoming a bit more of a theme. Meanwhile, consumers are paying more on non-mortgage, non-fixed debt than they ever have before. We're seeing in some cases that interest really starting to pick up delinquency rates, particularly for younger generations. Gen Z, their delinquency rate is comparable to that same generation, you know, that same age range back in the great financial crisis. So if you look at the, the younger people and the people that aren't earning as much, they're on a completely different plane of existence than the folks in the top 25% who are like, wow, I, I've never done better in my life. And you can see that in many other parts of the economy, regional banks versus money center banks. You can look at, uh, you know, obviously small and medium sized businesses versus much larger businesses. It's a very interesting distribution. And in the age component, while Gen Z is doing very poorly, the age group that makes up boomers, that demographic has never done better. You go back in history to that age group and they've never had the amount of wealth, even adjusted for inflation that they have now. And that set up millennials to be the generation that inherits the most real wealth in history. Yeah, I think these Fed distortions with the interest rates where they are, so the lag effects with the interest rates, the high interest consumer debt, what we're seeing in the data, and it doesn't affect the people at the top with the the 10% that own the majority of the assets and don't have exposure to the higher interest rate debt, the the rest of us, which includes me, they ha- they're draining their savings, they have um, less consumer discretionary income each month. I, I would argue this is from mayhem, c- not only the interest rates, the exposure to that, it's also cumulative inflation. So the narrative yes. going out there on business television and the jobs reports, the Federal Reserve Bank, the PhD economist, inflation is coming down. They just keep repeating it. But you were telling me before we started recording that this is cumulative inflation. It's just compounding on itself. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because this is something that does not get discussed enough, and it's a it's a misconception that's easy to make because it's intentionally mischaracterized. That narrative is always about well, inflation's coming down, things are okay, and it's often conflated even readily that prices are coming down. We've even heard that out of this administration before that prices are coming down, and certainly you know you could say from peak to trough and gasoline and certain foodstuffs like eggs, which were more about uh, you know bird flu than anything else. That yeah, some prices are coming down, but on a cumulative basis in the CPI index, it's not a situation of deflation. It's a situation of disinflation, and disinflation is simply prices rising at a slower rate from their current level. We've heard from Janet Yellen and recently similar thoughts from Powell that prices aren't going to come down. Yellen justified it by saying, you know, wages are rising at a rate that exceeds prices. So we don't need to worry about that. Now, that's not true, but that is a narrative that is being espoused to try to make an excuse that we don't need to worry about any kind of reset to cumulative inflation. Now, you can go back to the 1970s through the present, and there's nary a hiccup of any kind of disruption to this cumulative inflation. You've got like the great financial crisis, you've got the COVID bust, a little bit during the dot-com crash, but overall, this has just been up, up, and away. And obviously, there are certain areas where prices are rising at much faster than the rate of headline inflation, like medical costs and student tuitions and even things like auto insurance. And, uh, you know, that's also a big problem for consumers because that's eating away their pocketbooks in ways that aren't necessarily represented in the data that we're looking at. On the other side of it, you know, we've heard from folks that are saying, you know, inflation is, is, it's going to do better because if we look at this, you know, rent index from Zillow, for example, it's showing signs of deceleration. Now, the problem with that is that rent, as justified by those types of indices and looking at how it's calculated for CPI and PCE are two completely different bases. Owner's equivalent rent is based basically on your cost of living, your pri- the price of your home. And the price of homes for the middle class and especially these really ultra high end homes have continued to appreciate. There's about a five to six month lag before that passes into shelter in CPI, which has a 36% weighting, which tells us there's still more pent up potential for the largest weighting in CPI to begin moving higher again. And it's already pretty elevated year over year. And then one of the most beneficial base effects we had from last year was energy prices dropping year over year, which is set to roll off. So there's every reason to believe that we could continue to see the bit of an acceleration. We can look at the PMIs, these diffusion indices that are based on surveys of purchasing managers, prices paid 
have continued to rise globally and in the United States. You see them bottoming and starting to rise again. NFIB survey of small businesses that are planning to raise prices over the next three months, over 30%. That tends to track well with CPI. And you see oil prices running up higher, over $10 a barrel from their lows, again, suggesting there's some inflation in the pipeline, along with other global commodities, many of which are up 20% or more from their bottom in quarter four of last year. So all of this tells us there is some pr upward price pressure in the pipeline that could add to that same narrative of what you're talking about, which is pressure for the bottom 50% at a time where they're already under a lot of pressure. And I think that's one of the risks that we have. We've had a rolling recession in the manufacturing industry, arguably for about 12 months. It hasn't hit the services industry. But if more of that weakness begins to prevail in restaurants, in travel, in transportation, and otherwise, that does begin to become a concern. And that could be one that the top 25% can't completely offset with their spending pattern. So I wouldn't necessarily say I'm looking for an imminent recession, but I would say that the bottom 50% and their spending patterns are something that we should be paying careful attention to because I think they're going to slow further. I think what we're hearing from these CEOs is a sense that the, the working class and the middle class are not willing to spend. They are really trying to tuck away as much as they can because they're stretching the budget from both ends. This has been a really difficult time for a lot of American families. Yeah, there's a lot of substitution and trading down. Um, I mean, people are still consuming. They're still buying stuff. Uh, what we heard in the conference calls from Kraft Heinz, what they said is the consumer is buying private label stuff. They're not buying as many name brand items. So we're starting to see that people are, are trading down where they can. Uh, people are buying less. or But I think inflation has... Uh, so people like in total dollar amount inflation, uh, the spending is up. But I think inflation is they're buying uh, spending more dollars and getting less goods and services. So I think inflation is causing the consumer spending numbers to look higher than, and people are just using more dollars to get less goods and services. Yeah. So, you know, when we look at things like uh, real retail spending, which has been one of my favorite charts to keep coming back to, because it makes that point exactly. Real retail spending peaked in March of 2021. And it has basically been flat. There was one other bump higher in April of 2022, but it's basically been flat. And what is that saying? It's saying exactly like you said, if you're looking at Johnson Red Book, which I keep hearing about how well it's doing, if you look at retail sales year over year, any of these other measures are in nominal terms. If you look at them in real terms, that same growth is not there. And that's a big concern because it's just it's making the point you just said. People are spending more and they're getting the same or less. And so it's not showing up in the inflation adjusted data. And that's adjusted for inflation as we're calculating it now. And you could argue about the weightings and you know how accurate the numbers are. But I would say, if anything, in real terms, retail spending is likely moving down a little bit more than what these numbers suggest. Do you think then that we're going to see inflation or stagflation in waves like the 1940s or the 1970s, that the Fed is just going to decide, hey, we're going to have to let inflation run hot. We're going to have to fund these budget deficits. We don't have a choice. We're the buyer of last resort of U.S. Treasuries. And instead of, say, a 2% CPI target, the Fed's just going to say, OK, the new target is 3% or 4% going forward. Well, so Powell seems to become, uh, with each meeting, increasingly receptive to the idea of not having a firm inflation target, which maybe is the, the first step towards accepting a higher level of inflation, right? He's saying, hey, even in the face of this, what he's calling bumpy uh, road towards his target for inflation, that they're still not discounting three cuts this year. The recent Fed meeting was one where Powell had the opportunity to course correct a little bit and say, you know what? Recent data has given us a little pause. In December, I said I wanted to see six months of promising inflation data, and we just had two months of not so good inflation data. So we're going to push out that target out to the September Fed meeting, assuming that we get enough good data by then. We didn't hear that. Instead, we heard a Fed that gave the market every reason to price back in the June cut and to price back in a second cut next year. And uh, essentially override even what the dot plot was saying with a uh, median rate of four point or three point nine percent next year. You know this market is basically calling the bluff of the Fed once again, and I can't blame it, given how Powell came out and basically ignored all of his rhetoric from twenty twenty two when you know remember the 
Volker biography clutching hawkish Powell coming out and delivering a fire and brimstone speech. There's going to be pain. We might have a recession. You know, we're going to do everything we can to fight inflation. We'll hold interest rates high for a high uh, amount for a long enough time. It may cause economic harm, but we have the tools to repair it. That Powell no longer exists. This Powell has become Arthur Burns in comparison and has become much more willing to accept higher than normal inflation, a stronger economy, a tighter labor market, and nevertheless cutting into that environment, which not only defies their legal dual mandate, but it presents enormous risks of a policy mistake that could, as you were saying, bring about some resurgent inflation. Now, it's fair to say that a good chunk of the inflation that we saw was driven by supply constraints and an inordinate amount of demand from liquidity flooding the market, right? We shut down the supply chain. We flooded the financial system and the economy with cheap, easy money and stimulus. The dynamics are a little bit different now, but they're not altogether different. And that is because we do still have artificial and natural scarcity in energy, in base metals, in certain foodstuffs, particularly if demand begins to scale. And on the other side of it, there's an enormous flood of liquidity into this market. If the Fed cuts, they're cutting into a global liquidity environment that's looser than what it was before they started cutting which is kind of mind boggling. Financial conditions are looser as well, which again would suggest that you know there'll be plenty of amplification of demand from wealth effects that will be translated into real world economic activity. Is that going to be something that the economy can absorb? Will there be ample supply? I guess it depends on where that, that activity expresses itself in goods or in services. But I would say, yes, we're running a higher risk of inflation coming back if the Fed follows through with its plan to cut three times this year and one or more times next year, my personal belief is it's a policy mistake. It's something we've talked about at Macrovisor as well, that you know, going into this year, one of our contrarian thesis was inflation could actually pick up such that the Fed shouldn't cut, but they may anyway. And I think that's kind of where we are. We're in this environment where this is a very reactive Fed. At least that's what we've been told to the data. But now, from really December on, and especially the last meeting, even though on the FOMC committee, more members are worried about inflation than unemployment now, the chair is still 100% okay with cutting as long as inflation doesn't materially worsen by like their June meeting. Now, I think uh, this attitude of being sanguine about inflation actually has a similar impact of cutting right now. Because the animal spirits have already come back. You can see it in gold. You can see it in crypto. You can see it in stocks and real estate, in junk debt, and many other parts of the market. This is a risk-on atmosphere. It feels very early cycle in many ways from that perspective. High yield spreads are the lowest they've been since the first half of 2021. That's insane. There should be a more uh, um, appreciation of the downside and default risks in some of these lower quality borrows, but it simply does not exist because now it's not about just the Fed put. It's about the Powell put. It's about this idea that even when things are not situated such that the Fed should be cutting, they're going to do it anyway, almost in this idea of preemptively foaming the runway. And at the same time, likely making a policy mistake that causes them not to be able to cut as much as they want and actually maybe even having to go back into a hiking cycle should inflation come back. And I think that's also what what oil and copper and some of these other uh, commodities are telling the story about as well. Well, I feel that the Fed, the, excuse me, well, I feel that the Fed's not reactive necessarily to the data. They're more reactive to like asset prices. So if there was a stock market crash or regional banks, a bunch of them started to fail, then the Fed is like, we need to roll out these emergency liquidity programs. You said foaming the runway. So that's like BTFP or some other type of liquidity program. So the Fed just panics. This has been like the the new policy basically since 2008. Every time there's an asset price crash or there's problems in the bond market with a yield spike, the Fed just panics and starts to cut it's based off of asset prices, I would say, more than actual economic data. Yeah, I would say that's fair, right? When you have a disorderly outcome in the financial markets, the Fed comes to the rescue. And that's where the whole Fed put really came from. It was never about the economy. And if we look at how the policy is expressed and, and what the outcomes are after they intervene, well, it took four years after intervention to 2008 
for that money to make its way in the economy and for banks to actually start lending to businesses again. So it's really not about the economy. I would agree with that. And I would also say that, you know, in reality, the Fed is the board of governors is a hybrid entity, but the Federal Reserve itself is essentially a private bank. They serve the banking system over the interests of the country and the citizenry. And I think that if we look at policy actions going back 111 years, it makes that pretty clear. And I also think if they do cut a, do you think it's math based on the budget deficits that the federal government says, hey, wait a second, all this debt that has to be rolled over in the next 12, 18, 24 months, we don't want to pay a higher interest rate. The Fed's going to say, okay, we need to cut rates to accommodate these budget deficits for the White House and Congress. Well, so it's interesting because there's a discussion happening now about uh, bank reserve requirements as it relates to treasury positioning and whether that's going to be a part of the factor of how they do that calculus. And there's been a suggestion that, hey, just don't even count the treasuries among the the uh, assets the bank have that could be at risk. And if we do that, then they can buy a whole lot more and help to you know kind of fill the gap in terms of demand for treasuries, doing some of the Fed's job for them. So that's been a narrative that's been talked about. Obviously, if they do that, it drains bank reserves. If you drain bank reserves, you give the Fed an excuse to intervene. We've seen many Fed speakers talk about both RRP and bank reserves as what they're looking at in terms of when they want to come back in and slow down QT and start cutting rates. So I'd say it's a very relevant part of the discussion to see how that plumbing ends up working out. But one way or the other, whether it's very direct or somewhat more indirect, the Fed is monetizing U.S. debt. And Bernanke famously said, I think it was in, in 06, 07, 08, I don't remember exactly the year, but he was in front of Congress. I believe it was sworn testimony, but he said they're not monetizing the debt. But it's abundantly clear that that has been the primary way that QE has operated. And for folks that are not familiar with this, it's not just that they're buying debt at an auction and holding it and the Treasury is paying them interest. OK, it goes beyond that. It's actually a little bit more rewarding for the government. So there's a political motivation here. You know, when you get a credit card in the mail, it says, you know, six months free interest. Well, when you look at Q QE and how it operates, when the Fed buys debt from the Treasury, sure, they are uh, you know paid interest by the Treasury for the term of that debt. But every year, the Fed takes out all their expenses and then pays back the rest of the Treasury. So it's almost like interest free. And that helps to reduce the interest cost significantly for a government that now is facing potentially a trillion dollars of interest cost a year and in excess of that as time goes on. It's not just interest payments on the debt, and that's going to be a top line item. It's also how much debt needs to be rolled over because that yes. debt was uh, in the last couple of years, that was at much lower interest rates. A lot of that debt was short term debt that was issued during the pandemic, right at one percent or zero or close to zero. Yes, that's the other thing is, and that's a very good point is you've got a lot of debt maturing. It will have to be rolled over ostensibly at at least somewhat higher interest rates, depending on where Fed policy is as we see that. We also see similar in commercial real estate and office building debt. A lot of that was pushed forward to this year and next year. So there's a lot more rate sensitivity in some of those parts of the market than what we've seen perhaps over the last five years. Do you think that this means a very long-term bond bear market like Jim Grant of Grant's Interest Rate Observer has been predicting? You know, that's a really good question. And I do admire Jim's work. I would say that it really depends on how this all takes shape, right? We do have uh, really the most elections that, that humans have ever participated in human history this year. So it's a wild year. We've got a wild election in this country. My own personal uh, opinion is that we've got two bad choices and, you know, it's just kind of choose your poison and hope for the best. But I think it really depends on how we look at uh, spending moving forward. Is the government going to complete these fiscal programs that are late cycle fiscal stimulus programs and continue to run up the debt the way they have? I was interviewing Jeffrey Gunlock the other day, and he made a very interesting remark saying that this is some of the highest, if not the highest deficit spending by percentage of GDP that we've seen with unemployment this low, which suggests it's excessive, right? Do we continue to spend this aggressively? Does the budget deficit grow this much as we're looking at, you know, 1.8 trillion or higher? If so, and if we are not able to attract sufficient counterparties to the bid, and if the Fed is not monetizing that debt, then it does set the stage for that type of uh, potential outcome. I would be cautious to say it, though, because the other side of this is we know that during really difficult times, people flood into treasuries. Not always, 
didn't happen during the Israel Hamas war. That was one geopolitical risk off event where there was risk off in treasuries as well. And everyone went to gold instead. That was very interesting. But often is the case when there is a broader de-risking in financial markets, people actually go into treasuries. Now, we didn't see that in 2022. 2022 was a year where people were de-risking out of stocks and bonds and the uh, you know 60-40 portfolio kind of broke down. So I guess it depends on the context. My own personal inclination here is to think that bonds are going to lose attractiveness over time, particularly on the longer end. You know, why would I want to pay for a 10 or a 20 or a 30 when I can get a better rate going into something that's going to mature in a matter of months? It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm taking less term risk. I'm getting better payment. And yeah, the Fed is probably going to cut at some point. But for now, I can just keep rolling my exposure and have a bit of a ladder of different treasury exposure. So I think if we see risk off in the treasury market, I would expect it to be more on the long end until it gets to a point where it's appetizing to start buying them again. You also mentioned 2022. That's when the Russia sanctions happen. And, and, and we look at the data within uh, under six months. You started to see a lot of these non-G7 central banks, and these are countries that in the past, when they ran trade surpluses and had foreign exchange reserves, they recycled those into U.S. treasuries. That was going on for decades. So you had China, Germany, Japan, they bought a lot of U.S. treasuries for decades. That stopped. A lot of that stopped. It slowed down. There is net selling of U.S. treasuries by some of those uh, countries, but there's large increases because central banks don't have a lot of options to to buy with uh, foreign exchange reserves. So they can either buy in size U.S. treasuries or gold tonnage. And it seems a lot of the fund flows for those central bank, the trade surpluses, it's gone into gold since 2022 and the Russia sanctions. Instead of treasuries, it's been going into gold. Right. We've seen really, really enormous record central bank buying of gold bullion. Um, it is extraordinary to see that in the size that we've seen it. I think the sanctions definitely did put a sour taste in the, the mouths of many, particularly those that were worried, well, maybe at some point we could find ourselves on the wrong side of those sanctions, like China, like Saudi Arabia. Um, and that gave them reason to, to, to have a little bit of pause here. And then, of course, China has its own problems in their country where you know it's not as easy to just recycle cash. Trade tensions have reduced trade with China. Now Mexico is the biggest trade partner. They're getting less of those dollars. They have less to wash into our markets, I would say there's a number of different factors that are reducing that foreign bid. And of course, the largest bidder at treasury auctions for the longest time, well over a decade, was the Fed. So on TV, your business partner, Aisha Tariq, she's been talking about dividend stocks for some of these um, sectors that Stanley Druckenmiller, who's been taking profits in some of the technology companies like NVIDIA and artificial intelligence stocks, and he's been rotating into similar plays like gold miners, oil producers, and pipeline companies, some of the energy plays that you're predicting there's going to be shortages in the old fossil fuel energies, not the ESG, wind, solar, biofuel stuff, and utilities. You said this is late cycle environment. What does that mean exactly? Sure. So at Macrovisor, one of our themes for 2024 was looking at late cycle opportunities, but we had the, the macro thesis, but we needed to see the momentum because our mantra at Macrovisor is macro plus momentum equals opportunity. You can't really just have one, both together lead to the best opportunity. So we've been looking at late cycle plays and what we mean is late in the credit cycle. Right. So we're, we're in that later credit cycle environment right now. The Fed is trying to shift gears into an early cycle environment. We're seeing the market trying to front run that as well. But we're seeing incredible relative strength in places like industrials, materials, copper miners, oil services, oil and gas exploration, um, and of course, aerospace and defense and softs, right? Like uh, the DBA ETF, which has basically become the COCO ETF. So those have been some of the plays that we've been pretty bullish on. We've also been bullish on emerging markets like um, India, like Mexico. Recently, we just put out an article on uh, Vietnam. We're bullish on the Philippines here as well. And, and our real idea here is that there is an upside risk to inflation that's not properly priced into this market. Bank of America fund manager surveys show basically no one expects an uptick, and yet money is flowing to the parts of the market where we would see it benefit from that same uptick, and it's early stage money flowing in, what we're seeing in industrials and materials and, and energy and otherwise. And these are also objectively much cheaper sectors with some serious growth potential if we see those manufacturing PMIs really bottom and start to ramp higher, which we are 
in the early signs of emerging markets are cutting rates. We see global PMI is starting to come back up in manufacturing. That sets the stage for all these plays to continue rallying. So when we put out our 2024 outlook, that was part of what we were looking for, but we needed to see the momentum agree with our thesis. And now that it does, we've been putting those trades on in energy first, you know, because they were extremely attractive and we saw oil making signs of a bottom. So Liberty was one we were putting on in January, LBRT. But we've also been looking at other uh, plays in industrials, in uh, aerospace and defense. In fact, aerospace and defense, we've been bullish on for a long time. One of our favorite plays in that space was SAIC, which has rallied up double digits from those lows. And um, we're also bullish on certain parts of tech, but it has to be attractively priced. So like when Oracle got the, the, the just the, the absolute, um, you know, just everything knocked out of it after that poor earnings report, uh, just two earnings reports ago. That was a major buy in my book. You don't bet against Oracle over long periods of time. This company is involved in like every single uh, industry that is deeply embedded in this economy, whether it's finance, whether it's law, whether it's accounting or otherwise. And so when you see a dip in that kind of a company, uh, for me, it's very attractive, particularly given their valuation. Is it going to go up tenfold in the next month? No, it's not one of those companies. Is it going to steadily compound over time? Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's, it's exactly in that kind of group. So for us, we're very selective. We have um, strategies that really try to focus on uncorrelated returns with the broader market. So we look for things that are either beaten up and out of favor with the strong turnaround potential or opportunities where macro and momentum are meeting together and give us an idea that this is a broader, longer term trend that we can capitalize on. So do you think then based on central bank policy, if the Fed does cut rates, are we going to see a big rally or a bull market then in gold, copper, some of these other commodities going forward? I think if we do see the advanced cent you know advanced country central banks like the Fed, uh, the ECB and the Bank of England cutting and our our thought process is it starts off with the ECB, the Fed follows and then the Bank of England you know comes next. Um if we do see that kind of pattern of cutting, then yes, we do believe that it makes commodities a much more attractive place to allocate funds. And we're more interested in the well-run producers than the commodities themselves. But in that space, we're likely to see economic growth come back to a lot of the countries that are going to be hungry for raw materials. And I think that infrastructure play is important to take into context because we are in an, a world that needs to build up its capacity to explore for, produce, and transmit energy. And that's going to require an enormous amount of raw materials. And we've been underinvested in this space in energy exploration and production and transmission for well over a decade. So that is in the early signs of shifting. I think that we do see broader recognition that we need energy from more sources than just, you know, the idea of, of weather dependent power like wind and solar. We need hydrocarbons. We need natural gas. We need oil. We need metallurgical coal. We need all kinds of different sources of energy because we simply do not have enough. And if there's any idea of anything even resembling diversification of our energy portfolio, it's going to have to do with transitioning into a lot more availability of cheaper energy to make that possible. And along the way, maybe we can get more uh, efficient solar panels so that we're not just leaving out four fifths of the sun's photonic energy and heat radiation. Maybe in that whole process, we can find more reliable ways to store the energy that it produces and transmitted across the grid than lithium ion batteries that are also weather dependent. But in the here and now, we need stable, reliable, abundant energy. And what's going to cost not just energy resources, but lots of raw materials to get there. For building out transmission capacity, we need lots of copper. There's an enormous deficit of copper supply. If demand is to normalize, and we see it in Dr. Copper now, it's broken out of a massive trading range. That could be the start of a bigger move there. So I would say in some ways, it's already begun. And all the signs kind of point to that continuing. And we see uh, emerging market central banks continuing to cut rates. Mexico just cut. They're having a manufacturing renaissance in that country. That's going to spark more raw material demand, as is the reshoring and friendshoring and onshoring that we have happening as well.
And you brought up how commodities have rallied, what, 20% off the bottom, I think you said, since November. So there's been a rally. A lot of people don't believe it. So there's a lot of skepticism now about commodities. I know a lot of Keynesian hedge fund managers are shorting commodities. They don't believe this rally. They think that there's going to be deflation, that inflation's not going to stick around. And a lot of these guys, I think I've quite a few of them just started short funds for shorting commodities over the last like six months. They're good. I think they're going to be proven wrong because of the supply side problems. The other thing the market hasn't figured out, uh, Mayhem, is that with like Bitcoin mining, artificial intelligence, these data centers, there's going to be a lot more electricity usage and yes. there's going to be a lot more need for materials. So the market hasn't figured out that this next wave of technology investment is not going to be just like chat, G chat GPT and it's like a software program and it doesn't use any energy or anything like that. I mean, there's a lot of materials and, and electricity usage required going forward. Yeah, so it, it, a lot of points to talk about there that I'm happy that you brought up because it, it brings out some other research I've been doing. So for one, yeah, key commodities like oil and copper have had tremendous rallies from their lows in Q4. Even gold has had tremendous rallies. So when we look at it as some of the most important commodities, they've had significant gains. Now, there's obviously been weakness in agriculture and in some other parts of the commodity complex. Some of the PGM metals never really got off the mat like uh platinum, but overall, there are signs of a recovery and of a resurgence that's happening here. Now, in terms of utility scale demand, I absolutely agree. I mean, projected new energy demand in North America is set to double over the next 10 years. That's huge. I mean, even going back to 2022, the demand outlook was not looking for more energy usage. We were still on this trajectory of efficiency. But now when we're looking out the next decade, because of AI and increased cloud data center usage, because of Bitcoin mining, because of more manufacturing at home and reshoring and onshoring, that's also creating enormous amounts of energy demand. And we're not going to get it going down the path of just, you know, using existing solar tech, which is really, really behind where it should be, or just using wind and other intermittent sources of power. We're going to need a lot of natural gas and we're we're blessed. We have it. We have it in this country. We have an enormous amount of natural gas. We have an enormous amount of coal. We have an enormous amount of oil. We are equipped with all the resources we need to build this bridge into a more energy intensive future and then to eventually diversify that portfolio as research allows us to make it worthwhile. Like if we could go from you know, 25% efficient solar panels, which are like the top tier ones. And by the time that power gets to your house, it's less than 20% of it even being available. If we can get from that to 40, which I know is a huge leap, huge leap, could take a decade plus. But if we can get there and we have batteries that are modular that work in all temperature conditions, we can start to diversify our grid a little more. Does it mean we get away from hydrocarbons? Probably never. But it does mean at least we'll have more sources of power that we can add into the mix. And I think that's the most important part of this conversation is, is for it to be realistic. The Pentagon inter, uh, had a uh, contract with the uh, Federation of American Scientists. They asked them, OK, so, you know, the military is like the biggest user of hydrocarbons on the planet, U.S. military, right, by far. How do we fight a war without them? They asked. And the scientists puzzled over this question because they're like, gee, that's that's a really difficult question. It's not like you can have a solar powered tank. And when it runs out of battery, tell the enemies, hey, guys, we need to plug in or, or, or like recharge in the sun for a bit. That's not going to fly. So they came back with this idea of mobile nuclear reactors in the battlefield. And you know that that was a very reluctantly expressed idea. No one was adamantly excited about putting dirty bomb potential into the battlefield. But that's the choices we're left with. When we abandon hydrocarbons, there isn't any other real source of energy that we can use at the scale that we do them. And it's especially true for transportation. Everything coming on truck and rails, it's all, you know, really powered by diesel. Same with all these large ships. So I think we do have a lot of opportunities in energy. I've been really excited about that space. I know, like you've said, there's a lot of managers out there that just forever bearish on commodities, super deflationista. I get it. You know, they've been uh, uh, enjoying that atmosphere for, you know, decades. So it's really all they know. You know, 2021, 2022, and part of 2023, in their minds, is a deviation. Well, in our minds at Macrovisor, we're actually looking at it a little differently. We think this is not a cyclical inflationary environment. We do think it is a little bit more secular in nature. And we think that it has everything to do with, you know, a scarcity of raw materials and energy. And it's not because they don't exist. It's because we haven't explored for them. We haven't started producing them. 
And there's a, there's a timeline to get to that point, but it's years. And so we're in an environment now where if the economy really does pick up, we don't have enough energy. We don't have enough raw materials. If agricultural demand really starts to pick up, we, we start to run into production level issues there. We also are starting to run into issues with the uh, amount of clean water we have available. And we're running into some structural issues with the labor market. So we've gone from an era of abundance, which led to that period of you know slow but gradual inflation, to a period now where enough demand can really spark it pretty quickly. And so what I've been saying, even in late 2022, was my greatest concern here was that the Fed doesn't finish their job. And we actually see a policy mistake that exacerbates that scarcity because we are in that environment. We are in an environment where things are becoming more scarce that we need to grow our global economy. And it's self-inflicted. A lot of the scarcity is artificial in nature. It's from terrible policy. But we can't get away from that. We can't snap our fingers and magically conjure up enough energy. And of course, we're not going to get it from OPEC. They want energy prices to be artificially high. It doesn't matter that Saudi Arabia pulls oil out of the ground for $5 a barrel. They're not going to sell it for any less than 80 if they don't have to. And that's, the, that's kind of like the, the crossroads that brings us to this idea of there's a lot of investment opportunities in this. Like, you know, obviously one could look at this and say, boy, there's a lot of reasons to be bearish. But the reality is that's not true. There's a lot of reasons to be bullish, but you need to know where you're putting your money and how it fits into that bigger picture. And I predicted the uranium uh, bull market restarting a couple of years ago when Cameco was cheap. It was between eight and fifteen dollars a share, so it was hated back then. A lot of people are covering the stock now and seeing the hedging program and stuff like that. But nuclear power, I think, will solve a lot of these problems if the investment is made properly. The main issue has been the either lack of investment on the supply side for commodities or bad investments. I mean, we had an infrastructure bill passed by the Biden administration, and I think they wasted around $5 billion on eight electric vehicle charging stations. So, I mean, this is a capital allocation problem with the government uh, misallocating politicians and bureaucrats misallocating capital in the energy space. And we need the cheap electricity, like you said, the most the um, most efficient, cheapest form of electricity generation with the most energy density is nuclear power. And yet most of the capital allocation for a lot of these governments in the US, Germany, a lot of Western countries, it's been to win solar biofuels instead for the last 15 years. Yeah. And biofuels, I mean, it's really just wood pellets. Like that's that's such a misleading name for a source of energy. They're chopping down forests, turning them into pellets incinerating them and generating power, which is, I mean, there's nothing clean or renewable or, or desirable about that whatsoever. Well, and when or, we look or at, or they grow, sorry to interrupt you, or they yeah. grow, um, or they grow, uh, stuff on land that should be arable land for food. So yes. instead they're not growing food and instead they're growing stuff for biofuels. <laughs> Yes, it's it, it's it's a ridiculously inefficient process. It's probably not even um, in any way, you know, helpful in the sense that we're trying to reduce resource utilization, energy pollution. I don't even think in that sense it's helpful. Now, when we go to nuclear, I think that nuclear has a lot of potential. I think it is a very important part of the power puzzle to look at, and I think our biggest concern has always been long-term disposal and storage, and and it has a lot more to do with NIMBYism. You know, people saying, I don't want that nuclear waste in my backyard, even if it's in a storage facility that can last 10,000 years and no one will have to worry about it in an earthquake, right? There's there's this just idea that I don't want it nearby, and yet we all need energy, and people are perfectly fine with exhaust pipes pumping cancerous exhaust into their lungs, which have much more real-life deleterious impacts that causes dementia, heart disease, lung cancer, asthma, you name it. But when you talk about nuclear waste and storing that waste, no one wants it. And that's been the crux of the issue that's kind of kept us from realizing the potential of that source of power, I feel like. But the, the other major issue, and we saw this the last couple of years in the United Kingdom and in European Union with a lot of small business owners and businesses, no one wants to get an extra $1,000 a month electricity bill. So if you're a small business owner and you get hit with an extra $1,000 a month electricity bill, I mean, you're thinking like, can I cut expenses? How do I, how do I sell more items? How do I raise prices? Am I going to go bankrupt? What I mean, that's like a huge hit to your bottom line. Absolutely. Especially if you're a goods producing uh, energy intensive business, that can be a fatal blow. And uh, or if you're a, a data intensive business and you're having to use energy uh, to do any of the tasks that you do to monetize, you know, uh, the the server farms that you have for your clients. I mean, you just saw Amazon do a deal where they're building a data center right next to a nuclear plant. 
So they have a constant steady stream of power at probably a preferable contract price that they've locked in for a decade plus. So there's, there's definitely this growing awareness about the need for more abundance of energy and more stable and reliable energy and a lot of creative minds trying to take this to task, but we just don't have yet. And it will probably happen, but it'll probably happen more for the reasons of necessity than good planning. We just don't have yet the will to store nuclear waste the way we should, or the will to explore for natural gas and oil and, and really use them the way that we need to, to diversify our energy portfolio. And like you said, if we don't, then what happens? The cost of energy, whether it's at the pump or our electric bill or in the goods that we get in our home or the food that's grown for us, it's all related to hydrocarbons, some more than others. It all goes up. It all creates another wave of potential inflationary pressure. So it's in everyone's interest to have an abundance of energy. Now, is it going to be you know meeting all these green mandates and ESG nonsense? No, but that's because a lot of that was fantasy and fairy tales. The reality is you can't legislate a clean energy future. You can't say no more driving cars with exhaust pipes or no more you know, coal for power plants without actually having a plan that is realistic, that can be executed, and that uses hydrocarbons to get to that goal in the long run. And even then, we're still going to be using them, albeit maybe somewhat less. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a fantasy to want fully clean energy and then cheap electricity. It just doesn't exist right now. Yeah. Exactly. It, it doesn't. And, and yet it could. And that's the real sad part about it is if we wanted to introduce some intentional disinflation into energy to reduce costs for businesses and consumers and the government alike, it, there's every way to do it. It just requires the political will to acknowledge that this sort of policy has been wrong and increasingly wrong for the last 20 years. So as we wrap up here, I want to get your thoughts on maybe offense and defense. So Aisha mentioned on TV kind of defensive stocks, dividend stocks that still have some upside. Should people be looking to play defense with some dividend stocks here, companies that can still make earnings maybe in a recession or commodities producers that are low cost? Uh, how should they be looking at their portfolios for offense and defense risk on versus risk off here? So we like utilities here. I just wrote a piece about utilities as a as a you know play that's both defensive, but we just discussed the growing energy needs of this country. And one of the areas that's going to benefit from that is going to be the utility sector. If you're talking about double electrical uh, generation, you know, over the next 10 years, that's a space where they can realize increased revenue and likely increased profitability at the same time. So that's one area uh, to be more defensive. I like something like SPLV because the ratio between SPHB, the high beta large cap ETF and SPLV, the low volatility uh, S&P large cap ETF is very stretched into extreme greed territory. So for me as a pair trader and as a swing trader, what I would be looking at is for that to start to show relative strength coming back into low volatility again, that institutional rotation confirming the macro thesis that there's an imbalance of allocation too much in high beta, too little in low vol. And I would take advantage of that relative strength to get involved in a longer term swing trade in SPLV long and SPHB short. We're not there yet, but if we do start to see that defensive rotation, that would get me interested there. Defense contractors, I mean, looking at that as, a, as an area for a long-term opportunity in a world of increasing geopolitical risk, but also a spigot of capital that is reliable in a recession or not. Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, they're always going to get paid. There's always going to be some global conflict. There's always going to be contracts coming in from, you know, the U.S. and their allies that help to support their growth. And, they, you know, when you look at uh, the commodity space, it tends to do pretty poorly in a recession. So I don't know that I want to be too long as an offensive, but I do like it, like you said, as an offensive play. Long commodities would be the other side of the barbell for the risk of inflation and the risk of running the economy too hot. So looking at commodity producers in energy, in copper, uh, those would be two areas of major interest. I'm starting to like some of the senior gold miners here, but I don't want to buy yet because GDX call skew is wildly inverted. So, you know, they're showing signs of technical bottoms, but there's a little bit too much exuberance in the options. But I also like industrials, materials. I think those are areas that are showing relative strength that are offensive, late cycle, reflationary types of plays to consider. And then, of course, emerging markets as well. There's been such radical underperformance versus the U.S. by emerging markets. And I don't like China. I don't even consider China an emerging market, to be quite frank. But I do like emerging markets outside of China, Vietnam, Philippines, 
India, they still have stories that I think lead us to a five or 10 year investment horizon that takes us away from some of the turbulence of the US. And really, our goal has been and continues to be deliver strong, uncorrelated returns so that if you have your index fund safely tucked away, that's great. But what if you want something that's still going to potentially do well when that S&P index fund that's market cap weighted and all the big stocks isn't doing as well? And that's where we come in and are, are really looking to achieve this delivery of alpha during more difficult environments, but also consistent returns during the good times. And so that's our thought of being a little bit more tactical here, being a little bit more balanced on risk taking. I don't want to mirror, like you said, there's funds with 70% of their money in NVIDIA. I would never want to be in a position that concentrated. I get it. It's worked for them. Kudos. I hope they're able to get out at the right time and not lose all of that. But for me, I like to be diversified. And that's what I really promote as my thesis for both swing trading and investing. Never be too concentrated because a single position with that much risk can cost you too much capital on the downside. And U.S. stocks, I think, have a 70% weighting now of global market cap. I don't think it's ever yes. been that high. I, I think a major theme for the rest of 2024, though, it's going to be potentially more flight capital coming out of China because I think there's still real estate problems, banking system oh, yes. problems. Um, there's uh, there's definitely, I speak to a lot of China experts, a lot of them are worried about a currency devaluation to deal with all of the their banking system and real estate problems. So if there is a currency devaluation, I mean, there's a lot of Chinese savers, a lot of money, flight capital could continue to leave China. And I think that one of the intermediaries of this is Chinese gold demand in the private sector. It's not just central banks. I mean, Chinese private sector gold demand is soaring. And then I think Bitcoin's used as an intermediary to get people's savings out of China. Yeah, I think those are all really good points. And I agree that the, the malaise in China is nowhere near over. It's probably going to take the better part of five or 10 years before that real estate situation is over. Where have savers concentrated all their wealth? in real estate. If it continues to roll over or just doesn't recover, they're going to start to move their money where capital is treated better. And like you said, gold is one attractive destination with a very long history of people allocating in it to save in China, much longer than real estate. And yeah, there's, there is also absolutely the potential for capital to try to escape. There are pretty rigorous capital controls in China, but Bitcoin and other uh, mechanisms provide escape valves for that. And that can continue to be a bit of a theme here. My biggest concern with China is 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 you know the currency devaluation risk, but also the rolling debt default risk. You have a lot of very, very problematic debt that's exposed to real estate and infrastructure and other projects that's that's really kind of hanging in the balance here. If we start to see that pick up, if they're not able to ring fence that risk, I think that presents some risk to emerging markets in particular, to Europe, which tends to have more exposure to China, and to a lesser extent, the US. I would also be a bit concerned about the policy making that's happening in China. The leadership there has shown that really they don't care about the economy. They don't care about the market. They don't care about entrepreneurship or really technological innovation. They just care about control. And in doing so, there's been three years of ham-fisted crackdowns on key industries throughout the country that have destroyed promising businesses and have caused entrepreneurs and investors to flee the country, both in their capital or physically or both. So I think the story in China is one of they have a rolling crisis in real estate. They're throwing some money at the market. They're throwing some money at that. And in fact, to your point of devaluation, last night, the fix on the Chinese currency was much weaker than expected. And it caused some turbulence in markets, not just there, but around other emerging markets as well. I would say that is a realistic concern, that devaluation. Now, one bit of Chinese history to remember, there are two main causes of Chinese unrest. The first is high unemployment. And for a while, youth unemployment was so bad that they stopped reporting the numbers. Now they've adjusted them to make it look like it's better than it is, I, I imagine. <laughs> the other side of it is inflation. Now, when you start importing inflation, when it's not coming from within, from wage growth that offsets the rising costs, that becomes a concern that can spark that social unrest. So they're walking a tightrope. If they go too heavy on currency devaluation, not only does it present exogenous risks for other economies that are linked to China, it presents internal risks. And we remember what she did when the Chinese population started to revolt against the COVID lockdowns. He buckled. And so I would say that if social unrest mounts and it becomes big enough, this is a leadership, no matter how autocratic and, and, and sort of all powerful they may assume they are, when, the, when a country of that many people says no more, they have to stop. 
So I do think that that is their biggest risk. If they try to push too hard on that button, I think the Chinese people will get pretty upset because for a while, price stability and even dropping prices has been a theme because of how weak their economy is. Now, if you have internal inflation driven by wage growth and then other areas of the economy are rising in price because of that, that's tolerable. That's not the same dynamic. That's what Janet Yellen tells us we're having here, but most people say that we're not experiencing that. But if you import inflation, and it's an excess of wage growth that creates social pressure, that creates budgetary pressure, and that can lead to unrest. So I think China is the biggest unrealized risk of 2024 in that there's just so much potential for things not to go well and to spread to other markets and particularly other Asian markets and to a lesser extent Europe. It definitely sounds like the policymakers for central bankers dealing with the Chinese banking system, real estate problems, they don't have good options in China. You could say the same thing about the European Union, the United Kingdom and the US, uh, as well as Japan. So it sounds yep. like a lot of the central bankers, policymakers at this point, uh, with the amount of debt that the central banks and their balance sheets have had to add post 2008 over the last 15 years, that now they're faced with really bad options. You know, I will say this, and I think you'll you'll be on the same page with me. I don't envy any of them. I, I am very glad that's not my job because, you know, it's really like walking a very precarious tightrope. If you make one wrong move, the consequences can spiral and they can have pretty tremendous impacts in your own country and in other countries with interconnected markets and economies. So yeah, I think that that's really kind of a theme here. And I would even go so far as to say, I don't think any of them really truly know what they're doing. This has been the largest monetary policy experiment in human history. It's led to one of the largest multi-asset bubbles, if not the largest in human history. And everyone's sort of fumbling in the dark because we've never been here before. We have no idea how any of this unwinds or even if it can. And I remember before the Fed started started QT. The UK House of Lords, they did a study um, talking about quantitative easing. And they basically said, look, no country that's ever done quantitative easing before in the history of central banking has ever fully normalized afterwards. And we're already seeing signs that central banks are saying, well, that's pretty much the future. We'll never be able to get back to the pre-COVID balance sheet levels that we had. So on the one hand, there's this possibility of inflation coming back to Europe, to the United States, uh, to China, if they depreciate their currency enough, it's already becoming a bit of a factor in Japan, which caused them to move from NERP to ZERP, the first hike in almost 20 years. So there is that risk. And then on the other side, you know, if they run policy too high for too long in some of these more rate sensitive areas uh, like Europe as a whole and in parts of the U.S., that can cause harm as well. So, you know, I would say that no matter what they do, there's going to be a lot of folks that aren't happy. But as people that live in this world and live in the United States, we at least hope for the best, plan for the worst. And remember that really in this environment, accommodating into a market at or near all-time highs, crypto surging, home prices at or near all-time highs, gold hitting all-time highs, oil surging back higher, copper surging back higher, financial conditions looser than when they were when the Fed started tightening. All of that tells us this is a policy mistake, especially as inflation is so showing signs on multiple different levels of coming back. I agree with everything you said there. And then I think the regional banks are a ticking time bomb here. I mean, there's research reports coming out from a lot of different places that hundreds of them could be at risk if interest rates stay at these levels. So uh, next couple yes. of years are not going to be fun. Yeah, I, no, look, I agree. The regional banks, there's there's a number of them that are weaker. They have outsized exposure to particularly office building debt and some of the higher risk regions like San Francisco, New York, other metropolitan areas where vacancy rates are in excess of 30%. Uh, this is becoming a, an increasingly problematic situation. The good news is the risk is somewhat contained to what are ostensibly smaller banks, about 4,000 banks in this country. So several hundred regional banks, it sounds like a lot. It is important. Don't let me downplay that. But I would say that it could be a lot worse. And as we talked about earlier, the Fed could foam the runway for them specifically without changing their entire policy framework. The fact that they're not and they're leaning into cuts in this, uh, it does suggest, as we discussed earlier, really trying to monetize the largesse of the US government, which I think will be a tremendous policy mistake. So we'll have to see what happens. Maybe next time we catch up, we can review all of what we talked about and see where we are uh, then versus what we talked about now.
Yes, I really enjoyed this discussion today. There's a lot for my listeners. <clears throat> There's a lot for my listeners to take in. I want to thank you so much for your time today, Mayhem. You are truly a wealth of information here. We didn't have to take any breaks. I don't even think you took a water break. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, Jason. I really appreciate having uh, the opportunity to join you on your show again. And uh, always enjoy our conversations as well. So thanks again. And if my listeners want to check out TraderAid or MacroVisor, how do they do so? Yeah, sure. Visit us on the web, TraderAid.com and MacroVisor.com. Just a little bit of background. TraderAid is where we share education and swing trading ideas. Our focus is on longer term trades in U.S. stocks and options and commodities and sometimes futures markets. And we also have tools and resources for people. So, you know, throughout the trading day, there's audio and real time headlines. There's uh, custom tools that I've developed. I've developed my own Discord bot, my own option scanning tools, and otherwise. So, people have a wealth of different access to a, a seasoned community of traders, to an abundance of tools, ideas, and educational resources. Something I wish I had when I first started out trading, quite frankly. It would have been a great accelerator. And then, Macrovisor. This is a business that Aisha and I founded basically just over a year ago for investing. And it's all about longer term investing themes, uncorrelated returns, opportunistic, thematic types of opportunities. And, uh, you know, we really try to focus on helping people that just want to have ideas to invest in different parts of the market they may not otherwise pay attention to. And our mantra there is macro plus momentum equals opportunity because we marry the two to find themes and opportunities that can perform over the long term. And so far, it's it's been quite good. One of the plays I didn't mention earlier, but it's done very well as well, is Nintendo. And uh, that was another kind of turnaround story. And I, I really still like the stock. I think once the Switch 2 comes out, it's probably going to make its next move higher. Okay, so that's not like a uh, devalued yen uh, Japanese stock market because the uh, out of besides the U.S. stock market, what the Nikkei is one of the top performers. Oh, absolutely. In fact, if you look at the Nikkei versus the NASDAQ and you, you hid which label was which, you wouldn't know which was which. And uh, it, it's funny you brought that up. But just one last thing I'll, I'll say is, um, you know, last year, my trade of the year was long Japan hedged HEWJ versus short China FXI. I put that trade on twice on the basis of relative strength versus relative weakness, and it handily outperformed the U.S. markets. Pretty amazing returns, even the Nasdaq in 2023. For Nintendo, yes, there's definitely that element to it. But within the company itself, there is a turnaround story. So it's a bit of column A and a bit of column B for sure. And Warren Buffett had a lot of success the last couple of years in Japan, too. So um, that was actually one of his best trades was uh, investing in Japanese commodity houses in Japanese yen. So he was uh, hedging, I think, his dollar risk. And he got uh, in, I think he locked in like Japanese yen loans at a, at a low cost when he was making his equity investments. Yeah. And, and one of the smartest macro thing, I mean, he, by the way, he's totally miscategorized as just being a value a guy. He's very macro too. <laughs> it's, it, he's very, very macro savvy. He doesn't really talk about it that much, but it's, it's definitely one of the motivations for his trades issuing debt in Japan, in yen, as he knew the yen was likely to depreciate further. And at these very low interest rates, that is just mwah, chef's kiss. That is just a brilliant macro trade. And his newest one is what he's loading up on Occidental Petroleum Chevron Energy stocks. So he can't buy some of the smaller companies that our listeners can go and buy. So he has to go buy larger companies. Yeah, he's just got way too much liquidity for some of the smaller companies out there. And he's been a, a big buyer of Occidental really over the last two, three years. And it makes a lot of sense. The company has turned itself around. He's been continuing to add to that position. He also started to build back his position in Chevron. I mean, obviously, if he was, uh, you know, if, if, if we were back 40 years ago and he had a much smaller fund, he'd be looking at some of the small cap and mid cap energy plays that we're looking at because they're absolute. Like the, the, the valuations are absolutely incredibly attractive in some of these. Some of these are even trading below books still. So I, I think that in the energy space, you know, Warren Buffett's giving us another signal. He's giving us the green light that there's still some room here. Yeah, I agree. When he was a small cap fund manager uh, decades ago, I mean, he was producing insane compound annual growth rates. Yes, he just can't do it anymore with the amount of money that Berkshire has. But if, if, if he said uh, uh, famously, you know, if I just had like a million dollars, I could easily turn it into some you know unimaginably larger sum of money. But then the the rule of large numbers starts to become more and more problematic as you're moving larger and larger amounts of money around, and as everyone's scrutinizing your every single move. 
Yep. And he becomes index fund, which I think is what's happening now with this passive index fund bubble. Yeah, that that's a whole other discussion we should have like an hour to talk about, about how passive index investing has completely distorted the market. It's one of the reasons that Apple added a trillion dollars of market cap during a time where it wasn't growing as a company.